tell just by looking at the phenotype if the dominant trait is homozygous dominant or heterozygous. In order to find out what their genotypes are, we can do something called a test cross. During a test cross, you'll be breeding the unknown individual with the homozygous recessive individual and analyzing the offspring to learn the genotype of the unknown individual. Let's look at an example. Straight wings are dominant over curly wings in fruit flies. How would you determine whether a straight-winged fly is heterozygous or homozygous? Both the homozygous dominant and heterozygous genotypes will make straight-winged flies. If we breed this unknown straight-winged fly with a curly-winged fly, the recessive form, we could get two possibilities. If the fly is homozygous dominant, all of the offspring will be straight-winged. If, however, the fly is heterozygous, then half of the offspring will have straight wings and the other half curly wings. This is a great test for lab animals and plants, but you wouldn't necessarily do this with humans. It's also possible to cross more than one trait at a time. A dihybrid cross will test two traits at the same time. This is as big as a dihybrid cross will get, but it can sometimes be smaller. If you look at all the possible gamete combinations, you can figure out what the dimensions of a cross should be. So what gamete combinations are possible when the following groups of alleles separate in meiosis? So with all of these different combinations, remember that only half of the genes are used to make a gamete. So we get to pull just one A and one B. For the first letters, no matter which A or B we choose, we still get the same combination, capital A, capital B, so there's only one possible combination in this case. With this group of alleles, there must be a capital A, but there could be a capital B or a lowercase b, so in this case, there are two total gamete combinations. In this allele group, both genes are heterozygous, which will give us the maximum number of combinations. There could be a capital A with a capital or lowercase b, or a lowercase a with a capital or lowercase b. This gives us four possible combinations. In the last group of alleles, there could be a capital or a lowercase a, and both will have a lowercase b. So there are two combinations for the last group. The largest possible cross is made with two completely heterozygous parents. Each of the four gamete possibilities ends up on the sides of the Punnett square. Here, each of those different genotypic ratios are highlighted, and there are nine different genotypes here. But if we look at the phenotypes, there are only four phenotypes. Those show up in a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio, with 9 showing the dominant traits and the 1 representing the only time you'd see both recessive traits. But not every cross will be this big or have such a complicated ratio. Let's try a problem. Black hair is dominant over brown hair in rabbits. Short hair is dominant over long hair. If a homozygous black short-haired rabbit is crossed with a homozygous brown long-haired rabbit, what would be the genotype and phenotypes of the F1 generation? One rabbit is homozygous black and short-haired. So that's going to be two big Bs and two big Hs. The other rabbit is homozygous brown long-haired, so that's two little Bs and two little Hs. This is the easiest possible cross we could make. Each group of alleles has only one possible gamete it could make. Big B, big H, and little B, little H. So we make a square and cross it. So for the genotypic ratio, all of the offspring will be big B, little b, big H, little h. And for the phenotypic ratio, they'll all be black and short-haired. Now using the same rabbits, we'll list the genotypic and phenotypic ratios for the F2 offspring produced between crosses of two animals in the F1 generation. Across the top and the side are the four possible gamete combinations, too big, big B, little h, little b, big h, and little little. Then you fill in the Punnett square. The genotypic ratio is a big one. Here they all are listed out. It's not nearly as useful as the phenotypic ratio, though. There are nine boxes that are short black hair, three that are long black hair, three that are short brown hair, and one that is long brown hair. That's the 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio that we saw before. It's really similar to the monohybrid crosses as well. Let's look at a problem that uses a monohybrid cross just to review quickly. A yellow guinea pig is crossed with a white guinea pig. All of the offspring are cream colored. The cream colored animals are crossed. 16 yellow, 33 cream, and 15 white animals are born. Explain these results. And explain how a white breed could be developed by starting with two cream colored parents. Draw a Punnett square to illustrate your explanation. 
All right, that's a lot going on here, but we just got to take this one step at a time. The first cross must be homozygous dominant and homozygous recessive, which would explain all of the cream-colored animals that are born. Then, two of those heterozygous cream guinea pigs are crossed, which will give us the 1 to 2 to 1 ratio of yellow cream and white guinea pigs. 16 to 33 to 15 is very close to 1 to 2 to 1, which will confirm this explanation. Now, sometimes in a dihybrid cross, you don't see the 9331 ratio, and it could be because of epistasis. That's the effect of one gene depending on the presence of another gene. We use the example of fur in Labradors. If they have a dominant colored gene, they get black fur. If it's recessive, it's brown. But they also need the full melanin to show the color. If there's no melanin, then the fur is completely white. So the ratio becomes 9 to 3 to 4 in this kind of epistasis. There are other forms of epistasis, but this is just one example. Another strange kind of trait is a polygenic trait. Polygenic traits have more than one gene that controls the phenotype. There are over nine genes that control eye color. Other polygenic traits include hair color, skin color, and height. Now these are not fully understood yet, and their inheritance patterns are still being studied. While dihybrid crosses are great, there's a sort of a shortcut to finding the probabilities of certain combinations of traits, the probability product rule. You just take the product of the probabilities of an individual event, Let's see an example. If peas that are heterozygous for both tall stems and green seed pods are crossed, the probability is that 75% of the offspring will be tall. The probability is also that 75% of the offspring will have green seed pods. What's the percentage of the offspring that are likely to be tall and have green seed pods? Now all we need to do is turn the percentages into decimals by moving the decimal two places to the left and then we multiply them together. This gives us 0.5625, which is 56.25% once you move the decimal back. Pretty easy. Let's try another one. Calculate the probability that both parents will be carriers of cystic fibrosis when the incidence of carriers among the general population is 1 out of 20. Then calculate the risk of a couple having a child with cystic fibrosis when, in order to have the disease, the child must be homozygous recessive for the trait. For the first part of the question, we'll multiply 1 20th times 1 20th, and we get 1 out of 400, the incidence of both parents being carriers. Now, if they are both carriers, when you solve a Punnett square, you'll see that there's a 1 4th chance of having a child with the recessive disease. So we'll multiply 1 over 400 times 1 4th, and we get 1 out of 1600. This answer represents the risk of two people from the general population having a child with cystic fibrosis. It's actually pretty rare. Thanks for watching this episode of Teacher's Pet. Don't forget to like and subscribe and follow me on Twitter at SciencePet.